Well, episode 6 just confirmed it, Star Wars has now officially entered a new chapter, a new era, and it is so chock full of rich stories that I cannot wait to see what happens in episode 7 and 8, everybody's back, everything is great again, Star Wars is back baby, and I'm gonna celebrate this occasion too because I just opened membership for my viewers, all of you who join, even the low tiers where I get special perks and special emojis, even exclusive only podcasts and videos, we're gonna dive deep into most of these, so be sure to become a member to Tune in, we're going to talk about it more in detail there. Going into the episode, immediately with the appearance of the Lucasfilm logo, we hear the purgle call, essentially space whale sounds, great for falling asleep, but with the first shot right off the bat, we get new information. So I knew this episode was about to be a gold mine because you see the hyperspace travel effect is very different from when you travel between galaxies. I mean ordinarily when jumping to light speed in the original Star Wars galaxy when you travel between star systems we only have this light blue tunneling effect but now we have a more colorful add-on much more much more beautiful because we see the eye of Scion has the same colorful effect when traveling between galaxies. So next we have Hu Yang being a trap for a minute straight, can't believe he's traveling intergalactically with an, a whale's mouth, but Ahsoka brings up the stories he would tell them when they were young. History of the galaxy. Now Hu Yang says he still has the Jedi archives embedded in his databanks and he reveals the following. History of the galaxy parts one, two, and three. One being the best, of course. This is a super deep easter egg, and a meta easter egg at that, because it references the original trilogy. Some might argue maybe even the prequels. So, History of the Galaxy Parts 1, 2, 3. The first 1, 2, 3 Star Wars movies are A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. It's possible also he is referencing the prequels, meaning Episode 1, so Part 1, Phantom Menace, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, and Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. I think this is a direct reference reference to one of the trilogies because History of the Galaxy Part 1, 2, 3 and then he goes on to say a long time ago in a galaxy far far away. This is definitely super meta humor here. Also she has learned something from her experience with Anakin. Ahsoka is showing more understanding with the Sabine situation, kind of blaming herself since she didn't have enough time to train her properly. Here I think Hu Yang's response is that of satire because he still sees Ahsoka as not fully having experience with Padawan, something that Hu Yang has loads of, as we see in the Clone Wars animated show. It seems that the Eye of Sion has a brig also because we see Sabine inside it, pacing. Great to see Balaam back because he wasn't present at all in episode 5. This time he is probing to feel the mindset of Sabine, which he later describes to Morgan as impatient. What's interesting is that throughout this entire episode, we see that Balan does in fact has a secret plan he is scheming. He knows Sabine wants to find Ezra no matter what, but also knows that he and Shin are disposable to Morgan and Thrawn. He is definitely showing us that he is playing both sides. That will become apparent as the episodes go on, so Balin has a big surprise in store for us in the coming episodes 7 and 8. I told you this episode was a gold mine because as soon as they got to Peridia, a flood of information comes in. It's now confirmed via Morgan Elsbeth, the Dathomiri sisters are from this other galaxy. They are not native to the original galaxy, proving that Palpatine knew something was off about them and saw them as a threat. That's why he was adamant that they should be wiped out. They had traveled through galaxies even before time was counted, so we are now going beyond the Old Republic era, perhaps even beyond the Rakatan Empire. Also, Balin confirms that the Jedi I order knew about Peridia, explaining he had heard stories about it, as well as the migration patterns of the Purgle. This is not a ring, by the way, around the planet, it's a Purgle graveyard. We learn that they actually come here to die. This means that other than the Eye of Sion, there is probably no other way to get back to the galaxy, which I think as much as everybody is eager to leave Peridia, they will be here for a while, at least I think until season 2 of Ahsoka. After after getting a distress signal from the planet, they move down on a cool new gold shiny shuttle, but what's more important, the giant statues down on the surface kind of confirm the Zepho connection as well. It's very similar to what we saw in Jedi Fallen Order, and the same 
ones we saw in the Arcana Temple from episode 1. Next, we get introduced to a new character called the Great Mother. She is, as far as we understand right now, the one in charge of the Night Sisters and perhaps even greater than Mother Talzin. She also speaks in a ghostly double voice. She has two other Night Sisters accompanying her during this episode, but we see all three handle three devices that seem something of a hybrid between biological and technological, because later we find out that they can foresee the future using dark magic with perhaps the help of these three devices, later imprisoning Sabine because she reeks of Jedi. A great hint during the scene is the Great Mother knows how to sense Jedi, meaning she has encountered them before. Again, we get a bucket load of information. The Night Sisters are indeed working closely with Thrawn. The voices that Morgan mentioned calling to her back in the first episodes is now revealed to be the Great Mother. However, through all of this, we notice Balin's kind of worried. By the way, they are standing around the same ruins we find on Sitos, confirming Night Sisters had built it a long time ago. However, these are more pristine and held up. This was honestly a great moment for me. I've been waiting so patiently to get more, not only out of Balin, but his relationship with Shin too. And we got way, way more than we thought. We get not only one scene, but a couple of scenes with both of them that show a lot, lot more. First, we see Balon wants to be here, but still troubled. He mentions that the Jedi had long forgotten about knowledge pertaining to this other galaxy. Shin thinks that this was done for a reason. The seeds are planted now. I began being suspicious that something sinister was at play here, because Balan then reveals he was present or quote-unquote, saw the Jedi Temple burn. It broke him then, but he understood that it was inevitable later on, as he learned from history. He believes that power such as the Jedi or the Empire or even Thrawn is fleeting. It comes and it goes. He is seeking for a higher power, a new beginning, which he finally reveals to Shin. It is here if... He says the old stories are true. This is huge because it means Balan knows something that nobody does. Where did he learn about this power and who gave him this information? My suspicions went immediately to a Jedi holocron. You see, Balan keeps going on about old Jedi stories and folklore, so perhaps he found Jocasta's hideout where she was trying to rebuild the Jedi library. Uncovered this information about Peridia that an immense power is being held here. What's even crazier is that Balin later says he feels something stirring. Keep in mind, both Thrawn and the Great Mother seem very desperate to get off this world and back to the old galaxy. Thrawn, I understand, but the Night Sisters, they seem in a hurry to get the hell out of here. Whatever is hidden in this world must be really big and really dangerous. And I'm getting strong vibes that Balin is way too overconfident for his own good, and this source of power is going to be his undoing. I mean, just think about it. Soon thereafter, when Thrawn is introduced, he tells Morgan, our numbers have dwindled. Makes me think that they have been actively fighting something while they were here. Even if they did lose so many troopers from the Battle of Lothal, they will surely have spare equipment, armory. I mean, these bandits on this planet seem too weak and disorganized to be able to do this much damage to Thrawn and his people. So whatever it is they were fighting on this planet, it's not those bandits. Something really dangerous and strange is on this planet, and I believe it is going to be revealed in Episode 7 next week. So Sabine is trying to use the Force to open the doors, and we get a fake-out. The rumbling sound is not her succeeding in tapping into the Force, but a patched-together chimera with what seems like gold plating, the ship of of Grand Admiral Thrawn approaches the stone. And it was an extremely cool shot. This series is not disappointed when it came to its cinematography. Thrawn's introductions, Thrawn's introduction comes with the organ playing the classic Thrawn theme. I mean, it sent chills down my spine. His right-hand man is also called Enoch, which is a biblical reference. And his armor is extremely unique. His mask, his gold face, just extremely unique and beautiful. And from what we've seen, in fact, his entire army 
army has that different flair to it. Weirdly though, it seems that almost all stormtroopers have patched up armor. So does this mean that they, they were damaged when they made the trip? Or perhaps, as mentioned earlier, they were fighting this bigger threat. Only Thrawn seems to look the real part. His uniform looks pristine and as clean as always. Lars Mikkelsen was flawless in his performance once again. Once upon a time, he voiced Thrawn in Rebels, and now he is playing him as live action. It's just coming all together, baby. When Thrawn and the Great Mother are together, we get a bigger understanding of their collaboration. It seems that with Thrawn's intellect and the Mother's dark magic, they were able to coordinate in calling Morgan, coming here to save them. However, they also talk about a threat, sort of a threat of destiny, predicting the future kinda, which turns out that they didn't predict that Sabine would be involved, calling her a loose thread. This is kind of similar to Yoda saying the future is clouded. Thrawn, after being introduced, recognizes General Balan Skull of the Jedi Order. After Balan says he abandoned the Jedi long ago, Thrawn references he isn't the first one. He isn't the first and only one. Hinting again that he knows about Anakin abandoning the Jedi, destroying them, and becoming Darth Vader, someone he actually worked closely with at times. Sabine, though, is not happy to see Thrawn, but he acknowledges that she sacrificed his revival just to save Ezra. Because Balin had given his word, he honored it by giving her means of transport and sends her on her way unharmed. This is where we get introduced to a new creature called the Howler. They were wolfish kind of creatures at first from afar. I kind of thought they might be a version of the Loth wolves, but no. Also, there is a moment before Sabine leaves where Enoch helps her, preps her with information, and wishes her a good death. It really seemed that Thrawn's army, by being stuck here, have really become more tribal, foregoing the formalities of the old Empire ways, adopting a more warrior stance. Immediately afterwards, we see Balan and Shin are sent to follow behind Sabine undetected and therefore take care of both her and Ezra, if she is indeed able to find him. However, as discussed earlier, both Balan and Thrawn are scamming one another. Thrawn later reveals he plans to leave all of them behind, while Balan knows that something bigger is here that he needs to find, a higher power. Along the way, we meet the new bandits of this planet. This interaction between them and Sabine reminded me of the Tusken Raiders attacking Luke on Tatooine. They even made the same noises as Tuscans, as well as wielding similar melee weapons as them. Just when you thought the world building wasn't crazy enough, I mean, this episode was completely dedicated to building and fleshing out this not only new planet, but this new galaxy and how it works. We even got crab people now called Noti. When they're scared, they retreat to their shells that look exactly like rocks. But one of the Noti has a necklace with the Jedi insignia on it, leading us straight to their village where finally Ezra makes his first appearance in live action. And I have to say, Iman Esfandi looks pretty great now as Ezra. It really gave me that feeling that Ezra has definitely grown up and is now a hermit in solitude, in exile from his own galaxy. It was super neat to see him get back together with Sabine again after so much time has passed from the Rebels series these two characters together and of course who I can't wait to see Ezra and Ahsoka again together so episode 7 and 8 is primed to be some of the best content in Star Wars you will ever see but let's get to the juicy meaty part in my opinion this was the best part this was the Balin Shin episode kinda we get tons of new info in this scene too as they encounter the killed bandits Shin asks about Ezra Balin tells her that these new breed of Jedi that were trained after Order 66 are called Boken Jedi. Boken is the training stick that we saw in Episode 2 where Sabine was training with Hu Yan. This kind of indicates that they were trained in the wild, as he mentions. Balin, though, says he has trained Shin to be something more than a Jedi. This connects with what he says later. Shin is doubting their presence here in this wasteland, as she calls it, but Balin is sure this is where the great power lies. As an example, he mentions the great witch kingdom of Dathmiri. Perhaps he is seeking to resurrect something similar 
similar to that ancient kingdom, who knows, but Shin is wary that everyone is trying to leave this place in a hurry, but Balan isn't phased. And in fact, he recognizes that they are running away from a power greater than theirs, a power they fear and that he can obtain, because he even tells Shin that this power stirring in this place is calling to him. I think this kind of shows that Balan's downfall will be his overconfidence. There is a reason why the ancient Jedi seemingly buried information about this place, and the Great Mother and Thrawn are desperately trying to leave this planet. Whatever power is here on this planet undeniably is extremely dangerous, but I think Balan will learn this the hard way. The last scene features a frustrated Thrawn and Morgan because the Night Sisters have now sensed another presence coming, a Jedi. Morgan suspects it's Ahsoka, although shocked because they thought she was dead. Thrawn, though, is the one who will not underestimate her. Knowing what we know about the Grand Admiral, he will definitely be a formidable opponent in the next episode coming. So guys, talk to me down below, leave all your thoughts down below in the comments.